Oh, good morning. Um, you can hear me okay towards the back there? You're quite some distance away. Hello. <laughs> That's also to get some exercise going first thing in the morning, caffeine and exercise, so we'll have to wake up. It's a privilege to be here, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, come and talk with you. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider in the whole uh, justice space, in a sense, because I'm a neuropsychologist, uh, clinical neuropsychologist, uh, having worked a fair bit in brain injury and trauma in rehabilitation. But having done some research in the area of uh, brain trauma in prison populations in the last kind of few years, um, and one of the things that's obviously clearly um, incredibly important in the justice system is this problem of, of reoffending. And uh, although, and thank you very much, don't know if you hear that sometimes, but thank you uh, from the outside, uh, crime seems to be down and, uh, and being managed pretty well in the youth kind of sector. Um, but reoffending is the, one of the major issues. And uh, the reoffending factors. Um, that we need to try to identify seem to be a key uh, issue in, in the whole area. Um, and I'm going to talk about some, one of the main issues that might be contributing to, towards the reoffending kind of picture. And as you know, within about a year of release, about um, half of young offenders are reconvicted again, and within two years, about 75%, which tends to indicate that there's a need to think about what can we do different to try to improve this picture. It's also massively expensive, of course. Uh, so reoffending costs about 13 billion, um, according to some figures. So it's an incredibly expensive uh, issue. Um, as I migrated into uh, thinking about forensic populations, one of the things that I realized was the way in which forensic psychologists and psychiatrists tend to talk about in, and describe people who end up offending. Uh, they tend to talk about these issues of lacking impulse control not very good at um, having perspective on other people, uh, lacking empathy, uh, poor problem solving, not thinking ahead. So these seem to be kind of core characteristics of people who end up in the criminal justice system. And as we're really interested in, in brain trauma, this is uh, intriguing. Um, so I don't have much time this morning to dwell and go into the details of what your brain does and how it does it and where it came from. So I'll just be, try to be quick about it. If you're particularly interested, you can get one of my previous publications called Repairing Shattered Lives and click through. Um, and uh, there's an overview to the brain, how it develops, and all the rest of it. But uh, here's a brain. Um, and you all have one, which is wonderful, isn't it? Uh, and, there's, and all your cells are with you. All your brain cells are kind of there at birth. There's about 100 billion of them. Um, and each brain cell has about 10,000 to 30,000 connections to other brain cells. And the brain cells towards the front of your brain tend to have most connections, because that's where the really hard work happens in your mind. That's your mind's eye. That's where you are when you're thinking and problem solving and thinking about my next coffee and what's he talking about and why am I here not watching football? It's the stadium after all. So those kind of drifty kind of thoughts you're keeping to yourselves, thank you. Um, <laughs> or anything else after last night's wine reception, keep it to yourself. Um, so you know, these, the, the, your frontal lobes are doing a lot of the work and, and the consciousness. So if you were to summarize what the brain does, is it basically an approach avoidance system. The left hemisphere especially is an approach system. It kind of thinks, ooh, what shall I do? How shall I do that? Mm. And, uh, and plans ahead. And the right system is more to do with, oh, no, ooh, God. Uh, so it's to do with avoidance of harm. So these systems have evolved and all the rest of it to be able to keep us on track uh, towards what we want to do and avoid harm. So right hemisphere, left hemisphere, approach and avoid systems. And it's massively complex, <laughs> massively complex, um, with um, huge amounts of connections across, across the brain. Um, so your frontal lobe is particularly important. All of your frontal lobes are particularly important. Um, and your mesolimbic systems, your emotion systems, about your urges, desires, wishes. You can tell me about those later if you like. Um, so one of the areas that's particularly important in the area of crime, but also development, is the way in which we learn to control our emotions, but also learn to negotiate with other people, to get through life, to, know, to be able to deal with other people uh, on a daily basis. And here, I don't know if you can see this, actually, but, uh, but you can see um, over here there's people kind of who don't seem to get on with each other at the top there, Putin and Obama. I like Obama's stance and style there, uh, very good. And then you've got down here, um, somebody, uh, this, uh, the Welsh word is skornuggi, a snarling, snarling, this, uh, Putin snarling, that's very animalistic. You wouldn't want to have a chat with him, would you? 
or would you? I don't know, up to you. Um, and, uh, well, Trump, doing what Trump looks you know, like most of the time, I'm sure, a bit confused. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's an image from uh, uh, people realizing that Trump had won the election. I used to use, I used to use the red wedding scene from Game, Game of Thrones, <laughs> but that's even worse, isn't it? So there's these systems in the brain that help you to pick up on emotions in the face, uh, and have, and then build up a sense of other people's intentions and feelings. And over time, in childhood, into adolescence, you learn, you aggregate that knowledge into other people's minds, how to understand other people's minds and where they're at and what their intentions are and all the rest of it. And these areas of the brain, the hippocampal system is basically your real estate for your memory. Amygdala is your system for understanding. Is that emotionally important? Should I be afraid? Um, sometimes very afraid of some people. And then the prefrontal cortex, what decision shall I make here? Shall I shake his hand or not? Um, so these systems then evolve uh, from childhood all the way through adolescence into adulthood. And we tend to think by the time that kids are 19, 20, even into, into the early 20s, the brain's still evolving to some extent. So you might have seen this before, but basically this is a representation of brain development over time. When kids are about 10 years of age, there's not much prefrontal cortex going on, not a, um, a heck of a lot at that point. By the time kids are 14 and 15, the, there's one part of the brain that's very mature, and that part of the brain is the reward system. And they want to do what they want to do, and they want to do it now, and they don't care what you say, because they want to go off and do it. It's the teenage brain. It's very mature for um, risk-taking behavior, because they want to go off and do stuff, don't they? You think of your own little brain when you was 14. What did you want to do? You don't have to tell me. Again, <laughs> answer on a postcard. But by the time you saw 18, 19, 20, typically the, pref the prefrontal cortex and the dorsal lateral uh, frontal cortex has shaped itself towards being more adult-like. And that, those are the areas to do with long-range decision-making. Is this going to be my best interest to do this? Is this sensible? Should I um, talk to this person? Should I take that person's phone from them and run away very quickly or not? Or whatever it might be. Decision making, especially in the stress, is not brilliant in the teenage years. OK. Um, so um, one of the hidden disabilities, probably the biggest hidden disability there is worldwide, is traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is actually known as the silent epidemic. It's a, it's a huge problem, but people don't tend to be aware of it. Number of reasons. First off, brain injuries tend to be invisible. You can't really see kind of the brain in a cast and all the rest of it. You don't see that somebody's got a... So you can see a broken arm, a broken leg, but you don't see the broken or injured brain that easily. Also, people tend to feel that it might be stigmatizing. So they don't tend to say, oh, yeah, I had a, I had a head injury uh, three months ago or a year ago or 10 years ago because they stigmatize the identity. So one way or another, um, it's an identity that people don't tend to know about and tends to be also forgotten about. So traumatic brain injuries happen in all kinds of different kind of ways. The main ones are road traffic accidents and assaults. Now, in, in the population of interest here, assaults and falls on drugs are, are big ones. So if you had an assault, um, so somebody comes up, to, uh, comes up to you and punches you in the, in the, in the head, um, and you fall to the ground, and first off, your head is spinning. That means the brain is rotating inside the skull. The shear forces on the two hemispheres, the connections between the two hemispheres get pulled. Um, as you hit the curb, the, the, the brain hits the inside of the skull, jarring against it. There might be contusions, lacerations there, and it bounces back. And the deep white matter tracts, those connections across the brain, are being pulled apart sometimes. Depends on the severity of injury. So. Um, one of the problems with, with, uh, with, with brain injury as well is that the skull that's supposed to be able to protect the, the brain, typically useful, the case for it, um, the top part, this part, is nice and smooth on the inside. The bottom part, the basal part of the skull, is not. It's like jagged the edges, um, the sphenoid wings and all the rest of it. So the brain sits inside the skull, and the skull is a bit like a cheese grater, and the brain's a bit like jelly. Okay? So hold that image in, in mind. So it wobbles inside the skull. So that's why people after traumatic brain injury tend to have lesions in the frontal lobes. They are important for decision making, impulse control, and all the rest of it. And memory systems, temporal areas towards the side of the brain. So these two areas are particularly affected because they, they sit in this area as particularly vulnerable. So the, in terms of grading traumatic brain injuries, 
They might be an injury that's a relatively mild one, up to five minutes loss of consciousness, not too much of a problem. Five to 10 minutes loss of consciousness, starts to be a problem. 10 to 20, complicated mild brain injury. More than that, moderate severe brain injury. The more doses you get, the more likely it is you're gonna have lifelong neuro disability. So the range, the, the age at which people are most likely to have traumatic brain injuries is the adolescent period. This is a typical spike. This is our emergency department in Exeter. A typical spike in the teenage years for boys. Massive spike up, fights and all the rest of it. And, um, and so between 15 and 21, uh, particularly a risky period. But notice at the tail end, boys and girls at age three to four, when they're toddling, they fall. And much more likely in the lower socioeconomic groups. And these are injuries typically forgotten about and not taken account of. So no wonder they grow up to have ADHD and fall out of school and all that kind of stuff. So the kind of problems people have with traumatic brain injury, after moderate severe brain injuries, typically there are problems around cognition, not being able to think things through so well, sequence activities, plan, and impulsivity issues tend to be an is uh, a problem. And in mild brain injuries, the same kind of problems to, to a less degree. So it contributes to the problem, a bit like ADHD, poor concentration, lack of attention, and impulsivity. Again, a bit of a problem. And we find this organic personality change in about 60% of kids after brain injury, um, moderate severe, and about 20% of the ones with mild injuries. So in total, about three or four in 10 of kids after brain injury have ongoing neurodisabilities. So what does that mean in terms of social communication? We've shown at Exeter that kids with brain injury grow up from children into adolescence not being very good at reading other people's expressions, not being very good at reading minds, in other words, reading expressions. So this is an expression of, say, you know, interest. Kids with brain injury over here um, are much lower on, on tasks like this compared to neurotypical kids. So one of the key fact, um, so, so the kids with brain injury then grow up and they don't grow out of the problems. This is a, another big issue in this area is neuroplasticity. Plasticity does come in, there is change in the brains, but it doesn't compensate fully for the kind of problems the kids have. Now, when it, uh, the links between brain injury and crime are quite complex, but I'm just gonna give you a bit of an overview to some of these links, but also what we can do about the issue of brain trauma and neurotrauma in the population. One of the best studies in this area was by, is by Sina Fussell. They looked at the data set for crime in Sweden, the total population of Sweden um, is available for, for research purposes in this way. So they looked at the data over 35 years um, to establish who became violent offenders and who did not, and linked that data to the NHS data, health record data in Sweden. And what Sina found was that about 2.5% of Swedes become violent offenders at some point in their life. If there's a brain injury, it's 9%. So it's massive increased risk if there's a brain injury. But the sensible and clever thing Asina did was he then looked at the sibling, siblings of the brain-injured violent offenders and found 4.5% of them became violent offenders. So these socioeconomic factors and family factors that might be criminogenic, if there's a brain injury, it doubles your risk. If there's no, none of those factors, then it triples your risk. In a nice study in New Zealand, there was a tracking, a longitudinal tracking of kids who had mild brain injury when they're five years of age in Christchurch. So all the kids have mild brain injury in Christchurch were followed up over 15 years. Within about two years of their mild brain injuries, they were showing attention and concentration problems at school. Within four years, they were more likely to get expelled from school. And within 10 years, they were twice more likely to be in contact with the law. So you start to think, ah, oh, right, so that's probably where we should be investing more money. Teaching assistance for kids in neurodisability in schools might be an idea, more inclusive policies. We've done a, a little bit of work in this area in the UK and with international colleagues, and we looked at a population of young offenders, vulnerable people, in our young institutions, um, in, in one young offender unit. Uh, we had 200 um, uh, young people who responded, a 98% response rate, which is pretty good for these kind of studies. And remember earlier I described brain injury, well, brain injury in general society is about 10% of the general population have had a brain injury. 2% of the general population have had a moderate severe brain injury, 8% have had a mild injury. And in these young offenders, we find that about 65% have had a head injury, 45% of the overall sample have had a knockout history, and 16% have had a moderate severe brain injury. So one or two in 10 have an ongoing 
brain injury related issues, and another three in 10 will have some degree of brain injury related problems. Um, recently, there's been some interesting evidence building up in Germany around the presence of lesions in the brains of, of offenders. So in Germany, it looks like, you know, if you have a bit of a sneezy problem, your cold isn't gonna go away, maybe it's more than that, but people in Germany seem to get scanned on a regular basis. And there's been a building up of data on people who are in the criminal justice system in Germany versus those who are not. And if you look at the scans of those who are not in the criminal justice system, then about 10% have anomalies in their brains. If you look at the non-violent offenders, about 40% have, uh, have some anomalies in their brains. And the violent offenders, it's more like 70%, typically in the frontal lobes. And your frontal lobes are good for impulse control, decision making, thinking things through, planning ahead, and all the rest of it. We did the review for the Office of the Children's Commission a few years ago to look at how common are neurodisabilities of any kind that we can find out from studies around the world in young people in custody around the world. And there wasn't a huge amount of data. There weren't, there weren't many studies in the area, so it's an area that we do need much more research in. But these are some of the highlights from, from that review. What's in spectrum disorder in the general population? Less than 2%. Prison population, young offender population, 15%. Um, ADHD, general population, say 3 to 5%. Prison population, say about 15 to 20%. Brain injuries, general population, about 20%, maybe, possibly, in the, in the young, and more like 60 to 70% in the ones in, in custody. The, the big issue, one of the effects of these neurodisabilities is an, a problems in being able to communicate. 60 to 90% of young people who come into the justice system have some kind of language and communication problem. So it might be a direct problem with, with language, or it could be the pragmatics of language, understood and follow what's being said, or the emotional context of pragmatics of language. So a few years ago, um, they added in things like neurodisability into the comprehensive health assessment tool to help assess young people coming to the secure estate in, in England and Wales. And uh, which, which is a very good thing, as, uh, alongside doing mental health assessments and various other assessments, there is a problem here in terms of being able to use this information to guide practice, because there seems to be a, not much of a link sometimes between healthcare and um, interventions in, in prison, so that's something to really address. But anyway, um, we looked at the first 90 or so kids assessed on the comprehensive health assessment tool and found that about 80% had brain injuries. In the ones with ongoing problems due to the brain injuries, so they have problems with not remembering what's been told, being irritable, feeling headachey, those kind of problems. The ones with more of those issues, uh, compared to the ones with well, those issues, were twice more likely to feel suicidal, twice more likely to be self-harmful. So it adds to the picture of not being able to control their emotions and feeling overwhelmed in these prison systems. In the last few years, there's been interest in this area because, as I said right at the start, the reoffending issue is one of the biggest problems because kids to start off early in terms of offending patterns and then carry on into adulthood are, uh, in their own lives, um, it, it, it's such a hard thing for them because they're not going to be able to maybe build a life for themselves, but also it's very costly in terms of human tragedy and economic costs. So the factor that's been identified like neurodisability, traumatic brain injury, might be important to address because we can, if we address these issues, we might re reduce long-term offending and increase the chances that these young people can be back on a better track into education, into employment, or wherever it might be. There's been interesting parliamentary activity in this area. In the Scottish Parliament, uh, they have a, um, uh, they're looking to how to transform the justice system in Scotland to take account of these kind of factors. And last year, the Justice Committee of the um, London Parliament uh, advised uh, HMPPS and the at the time NOMS and Ministry of Justice that it would be important to take account of factors like brain injury and neurotrauma and adversity in the management of young people who offend, not only to reduce violence, but also to, re to reduce the risk of suicidality. So some of the actions that, that could be taken to take this forward, and some things are happening already. So one thing that's, that's relatively clear to me anyway is that we need to do much more in terms of liaison and screening of kids with neurodisability in terms of keeping them in schools. That's the best environment for kids, schools and homes and all the rest of it. That's clear. Um, 
then when kids start to get excluded and start to enter the criminal justice system, we need to be even better at trying to address these issues before they um, get even more out of control. So picking up these vulnerabilities. An example of this is in New Zealand, which has become used as a model by the UN. Um, Judge Beecroft, who saw the table on the number of kids in custody with neurodisabilities, saw an opportunity to screen kids in New Zealand for neurodisability and offer restorative justice in the community more regularly for kids who are identified in this way. And that's been a factor in reducing the number of kids coming to custody in New Zealand and, um, and improved outcomes. Uh, the Sentencing Council in the UK have recently um, advised that neurotrauma and adversity should be taken into account when it comes to sentencing kind of policy, which is important. And the increased liaison. I mentioned this problem of lack of you know, coordination sometimes between systems. We need better liaison and we need better data systems to help healthcare and prison and justice workers to work together collaboratively. We need those systems to be more effective. Um, one of the initiatives that we've been behind or developed uh, recently was link workers, brain injury link workers, putting them into, into young offender units and prisons. And the brain injury link work has been quite helpful in terms of helping staff understand when somebody has a brain injury and other kinds of neuro issues to help them understand how to work with these individuals more effectively. So this is one young, young man, he's 17. Uh, in a note, he said he had a fractured skull, but no brain injury. Okay, hang on, that's a bit odd. Fractured skull, no brain injury, hmm, something a bit odd there. Um, uh, but he was losing privileges, getting more and more angry, throwing stuff at staff, get, being violent, be, on, on track to being on, uh, being secluded. And uh, so a brain injury link worker did an assessment, a neuropsych assessment, and found that his visual skills were average, but his verbal skills were at the first percentile. In other words, 99% of people will be better than him. In other words, he could not follow or remember what's been told. So coming up with relatively straightforward pictograms like these, self-control meters um, and uh, personal space meters, I think you're too close to the person you're, you're with, and when's going to be my next break, or when's my next TV time, or when can I next be in, in association, those really helped him understand what's going on and reduced the chance of being more violent and suicidal within about a month. He was on the resettlement wing and ready to go back into the community. So more initiatives like this to try to take account of some of the cognitive and emotional impulsivity type issues might be helpful. The Youth Justice Board in Wales have started an enhanced case management program. You'll hear about more about that in, in a moment. That takes account of, tries to take account of adversity and neurosability in the population. So there's a range of issues that we can address. Uh, in the population. And um, what I want to emphasize is that children with neurodisabilities tend to come from, especially traumatic brain injury, tend to come from sector societies without much in the way of privilege and opportunity. And they're the least likely to get support, the least likely to get somebody helping them to be able to stay in school, and least likely to be the ones able to access healthcare. And they do not grow out of the problems. Brains are plastic, they're amazing, and the way in which the brains can accommodate injury and lesions and all the rest of it. But the problem when the brain's been injured is that there's lots of connectivity. And it's the, one of the big problems is that it's less speed, less capacity to deal with dynamic situations, like dealing with other people, holding yourself in when you don't deal with somebody being annoying to you and all the rest of it. So dealing with complex social situations. Um, school inclusion needs to be really thought about and how schools link to um, justice systems. We really need to think more clearly about kind of what can happen there and, and provide more targets for schools about including kids with neurodisability and who are in contact with the law. Um, parent and carer support is fantastically important. I uh, can't go into this in much detail, but that's so incredibly important one way or another. E and in including carers who are non, um, uh, who are the social care carers. Screening is incredibly important. And of course, we're in an age where there are massive opportunities when it comes to technology for improving our ability to help people to remember what to do and when to do them. I and mean, how many of you message your kids to say, have you remembered to do whatever it is? How, do, do, you, do you remember to take the train home tonight at 10 o'clock like you said you would? Anybody do that with their kids or just me? <laughs> is it just me? Yeah, okay, you yeah. Yeah, know. So there must be a, an app for that, right? Okay, okay we're developing one next, sir. We'll come back to that. Uh, Cena has an app for predicting violence, which is actually pretty good. Uh, it's been well validated, we're, and we're developing 
that further tick on brain injury, which is actually quite good at predicting who's going to be violent within the next six months. That's quite handy. To then say, this is the support you need. It's not to say violent, it's to say, this is the support you need. Okay. So to borrow an analogy from economics, investing early and well in our children's development um, uh, is what we need to be doing. It, it will increase the rate of return in later life and in so doing improve not only the lives of individuals, but also society as well. Because a lot of money seems to be lost one way or another in the criminal justice system to reoffending and offending and all the rest of it. It would be much better if we're much more sensible about how we can invest those resources in enabling development at a young age. Thank you.